for joining us on a day when Melanie rejoins us. Many of you have got to know Melanie Sill, who is today's speaker and was our executive in residence um, during the past semester and a very big part of the life of the school, uh, really participated so wonderfully and spent her time so wisely um, and came up with this wonderful report on open journalism, which I had the treat of uh, participating with her in presenting at the Washington, uh, at the National Press Club in Washington. Um, and it, it is not because I value Washington more than I value LA <laughs> that we did it there first. We knew that we were going to be doing it here and um, giving you a chance to, to read the results of this really rich reporting. And it's just a kick to have you back with us. Speaking of back with us, Pekka Pekala, who was our uh, research scholar last year, before Jennifer Taylor this year, is back with us, back from Finland, and engaged in the life of the school again in lots of interesting ways. And I want to introduce a colleague of mine who runs the Missouri School of Journalism, my former boss, Dean Mills, who's with us today, and Sue, his wife. These are good friends, and they have a place in Oceanside, so they, I beg them to come up for the day to hear this and do other things in LA. I know that they uh, know many of you, and it's fun to have you here with us. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Melanie, and thank you so much for coming back to make this presentation. Well, thanks. It's great to be back. It's, um, it's hard to believe, but it's been almost a year since I was here speaking at a director's forum last February, I think, uh, about some of the things we were doing at the Sacramento B Rose, the editor to use uh, digital technology to connect better with our audiences and um, to just do some interesting things journalistically. And uh, as, as you know, I left the be uh, a few months ago and I came here to dig into these questions that really seem to be at the heart of some of the challenges facing journalism now. And that, uh, you know, the core of it is when information is flowing everywhere as it is now, what's the role for journalism? How is that different? And how do we do our jobs in engaging people in public affairs and uh, in informing them, of course, but also empowering them as citizens to, to take full part in our democracy? And um, that work uh, resulted in my paper, uh, The Case for Open Journalism Now. Um, and I had a lot to help on that. Um, from uh, uh, Gabe, who's not here, but uh, Elisheva and Bergen and Kirsten, and many people who brainstormed with me as I was thinking about how to focus. Now, I'm not going to summarize or recap the paper. I do hope that you'll read it and that uh, many of you might respond and, um, and comment. But what I want to do today is talk a little bit about the ideas and the context and the reasons that I think that there's a need for uh, a change in mindset in journalism. And then really do a lot of show and tell because I think journalism is a discipline of action. We understand it better when we see how people are doing journalism using some of these ideas. So, uh, you know, it's, it's funny when people talk about new ideas in journalism, often they say, you know, but journalism isn't really changing. It's just that we're using different tools. And, um, and, and I think that's wrong, actually, because if you're a student of the history of journalism, you know that journalism is very much a reflection of the culture of its times and of the politics and economics of its times. Journalism has changed over the years, uh, perhaps not in some of its very core values, but in, in its character and its behavior, journalism has not been always the same. Many of uh, us grew up in journalism framed very much by the values that uh, took shape during the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s and through Watergate, uh, and that was a whole generation of journalism. But uh, journalism does need to change, not, not because the values are wrong, the values are right, but because this revolution we call the internet has changed not how people get news, but it's changed everything about how people communicate. And so I wanted to focus on one story that I think really illustrates this. It's a story, ongoing story, uh, that we know very well, and that's Occupy Wall Street. Now, has anybody not seen some version of this uh, yeah. image? This is the famous UC Davis police officer um, taking down this bunch of unruly students here. Uh, now, um, 
This was a photo, this Jeff Insomnia, I got this photo uh, on Flickr using a Creative Commons license, so it's, it's not a, a copyright violation. But um, this, the whole cycle of how people get information has been reconfigured, not just by the internet, but by the advances in consumer technology, especially mobile technology with news. So anybody now can transmit, uh, can capture and transmit news. So this mistake by a, a, a campus police officer became almost instantly an international internet phenomenon, uh, a meme you know, that was picked up and recycled and trained and transformed by so many different ways. Uh, this is a Cotty Park, which almost feels like it's in my neighborhood because I'm so familiar with it through the coverage. And of course, LA had its uh, turn in the Occupy spotlight when the uh, city decided to move protesters out late in the year. Now, this is how I followed this story um, that night uh, when, the, when the encampment was being removed. Um, I did uh, watch television news, and I didn't uh, wait for the morning paper to find out. I didn't even go to news websites to see what they were posting. I watched it via my social media feed. I was doing some other work. Uh, and I had uh, two live blogs open on my screen. One was uh, the KPCC live blog, and another was Neon Tommy. And of course, this is a new kind of journalism skill. It, it's maybe akin to the old uh, job in a newsroom of a reporter who would anchor a story, taking feeds from people out in the field and turning them into a coherent story that you would then put out for broadcast for print publication. But this is actually, I think you have to be a lot quicker thinker to do this very well. It requires news judgment. It requires a, a quick fingers and a quick mind. And this is a, a, a growing art form in journalism. Now, occupiers are telling their own stories, of course, um, through social media. Uh, there's specialized coverage. This is Greg Mitchell of The Nation, who has been live blogging on Occupy. Uh, I think he's still going since October 1st. We do the same for WikiLeaks. He's, uh, if you want a one-stop, he's providing a one-stop place to keep up with Occupy News. They have their own newspaper, <coughs> great name. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, various individuals and organizations are reporting on things they find important that are not necessarily being uh, broadly reported in the mainstream media. Josh Stearns is with an organization called Free Press, and he is the only one I know who's really uh, focusing and reporting on keeping up with journalists the rest of the country. And it's uh, and he's uh, you know doing a lot of uh, confirming and verifying, so he's not just picking up other reports. And I haven't seen anyone else doing this. So this is another kind of information. People are uh, picking up news reports and remixing them, putting their own spin on this with a quick Google search. And on uh, Canada, you know, you know, we see various spins on that. Of course, there's lots of news coverage from journalists. And uh, the coverage is being covered, too, by uh, citizen journalists and others who are keeping watch on uh, the mainstream media. I wanted to come back to this photo because if you look past this officer, you see in the crowd there, almost every person, every other person has some kind of camera pointed toward this, which, um, you know, if there's, if there's an image that shows a cultural divide, <laughs> this might be it. Uh, maybe he's not aware he's being watched, uh, photographed, <laughs> videotaped. But it's still almost impossible to believe that he did this. Um, but it also is an image that says a lot about uh, about the way news is uh, in, in, in breaking news events and crisis and so on. Uh, how uh, consumer technology and, and um, social media are changing how news is. I don't think anybody could tell you who broke this story. Who broke the story of the Davis officer pepper spraying the protesters? I don't think any news organization could claim to own this story. But there is a role for journalism, of course, but it's no longer uh, what it used to be. It's a quote from my friend Howard Weaver in 2007. The old gatekeeper role, if we ever needed proof these past couple of years, is it. This is not the core function of journalism anymore to take in information and decide what should be 
put out and put it out. Um, he <coughs> said that the fences are down and the cows are in the pasture, but I couldn't find a cow picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, recording still matters. This is just a, a something I picked up a quick uh, post from the LA Times on one of their blogs a couple of days after. They also did a story for the paper. They uh, went and got a, a list of a database of all the people arrested and they did analysis of it and they told us what the demographic breakdown, how many were employed, what they did for a living, and so on and so forth. So, um, so this is not something that you can get from the crowd. Um, there's been lots of uh, good journalism. Another, another thing that uh, you see with the uh, New York Times and the way they organize the coverage, um, public opinion and the occupying movement, what are your thoughts about the movement? You see a lot of ways that new news organizations, the smartest news organizations are, are looking at what's going on and then trying to be additive and so on. And so this begins the kind of conversation about when information is abundant information on the basic facts of something happening, like it's going everywhere, how does journalism provide value? And of course, there are answers to that. Um, I broke down open journalism, the attributes. It's, a, it's an approach to journalism. It's not a replacement. So we've been through all that. We're going to have citizen journalists, or we're going to have professionals, or the citizen will replace the professionals. And I think we're really past that, really. We're going to have uh, information coming from lots of different sources. Journalism is not the gatekeeper anyway, anymore. But journalism is still needed, perhaps more than ever. But the roles are different. So uh, the attributes of open journalism, I think, open journalism means that in doing journalism, you're transparent, you're accountable. Some of the things we expect from people we cover, some of the standards journalism holds public officials to, we, we play by those rules. Responsive, participatory, and in a reciprocal way. So the early kind of participation, I think, was fairly trivial, right? So. Here's a story, you can comment on it. And we know that on many news sites, including uh, the bees, this kind of got out of control. So as, as news organizations began struggling with how to keep the, the vandals and the trolls from, from taking over their comments, they started spending all their attention on participation on the problem. So participation started being seen into a newsroom as a problem. That's the commenters. I think that's trivial participation. I'm not sure it adds value journalistically. Um, so we're getting now to see, uh, and I'll show some examples of more reciprocal and substantial and beneficial participation. Collaborative, this is one of the big changes in journalism that we've all seen um, among news organizations, collaboration. And network, which is that journalism does not stand apart from this network universe I'm describing. It's part of it. It understands, it comprehends, it connects with it. So I'm, I'm going pretty fast because I want to make sure we have time at the end. But if anybody wants to stop me at any point, please do just shoot up your hand and I'll stop. Uh, but now uh, on to the uh, show. <coughs> so ProPublica, uh, the nonprofit investigative outfit in New York, they, they've had transparency built into how they operate from the beginning. It's interesting for an investigative outfit. Um, anybody can use their stories, although there are some restrictions. A couple of weeks ago, they launched a new tool I really like called Explore Sources. Now, Explore Sources on a story means that they are uh, showing the direct sourcing for specific facts in a story. And this is really key, I think. This gets at this idea of show your work, which is sort of a theme of open journalism. You remember a math, math class, if you did a proof break, you had to show your work, you had to show how you got to it. This is the kind of idea of show your work. So with all this information flowing, people distrust, you know people distrust journalism. How, how do we kind of gain credibility? So not just the conclusions we drew, but we're going to show you the work, we're going to show you the data, we're going to show you the sourcing, how we got to that. Uh, nonprofit news starts. News uh, sites 
websites in terms of transparency do much better than mainstream. And almost every nonprofit or, or new, uh, new site you find an about page that says something like this. You know? Editorial mission, how you're funded, how to reach us, uh, how we operate. Uh, just for fun, sometime, go in and try to get this information out of the new site that you rely on most. Let's figure out if you can see how do you report a news tip, or if you see an error, how do you report it? We don't do very well because we assume everybody knows. And I can tell you, sometimes I land on a news site and I don't even know what state it's in. I don't mean it's, it's the, the eagle. <laughs> the eagle, okay. Could be just about it. So transparency, this is the easy part. Um, responsiveness, uh, KPCC on their Facebook page. You know, a lot of sites have Facebook pages and people comment, but I think the commenters often wonder, does anybody ever read this? Well, if you, if you solicit comments, you should read them. If somebody points out an error, the dreaded apostrophe error, <coughs> um, you should respond. And so KPCC does, and so you can well point that out. Thank you. So Kay knows somebody's reading these comments. It's not just an exercise. This is KMU in Columbia, Missouri, um, and they are using G uh, Google Plus to do Hangouts uh, for <coughs> viewers, and they're getting a lot of attention from this. In fact, the BBC uh, was coming in to visit, I think, and see how they're doing this. Uh, Sarah Hill is using Google Plus a lot to interact with uh, viewers, and, and actually they have people all over the world apparently watching KMU online, you know, <laughs> thanks to this company. This is uh, another kind of participation. I really like this one, the New York Times, the WNYC teamed up during the Bird Week in New York. <coughs> and uh, they did a whole bunch of things on the City Room blog. And this was one of them where they had people text them, not email them, but text them their favorite bird watching spots. And this is important because a lot of people have mobile phones, almost everyone, but only about 40% are smartphones. So they're using texting to reach more people. And um, the other thing I liked about the bird watching uh, participation was that they uh, worked with the Audubon Society and another bird watching group and, uh, and acknowledged and pushed people toward what they were doing. So often uh, news <coughs> organizations say, hey, come, uh, come to us. Come put your stuff where we are. And one of the things about open journalism is understanding that people are active and posting and participating um, in lots of ways and not necessarily on your news site. So as journalists, we should go where the people are, right? Not expect them to come where we are. So they did that with the bird watching. David Brooks, uh, late October, he wrote a column and he said to his readers over 70, send me your life report. I'm interested in hearing from you about what's going on. How does your life look at this stage in life? And so they, he got, uh, I think, a couple of thousand responses. And then he picked one per day, and he posted them in his blog through the month of November. So this is Noah Inbody's life. And then at the end, Brooks wrote a follow-up column sort of characterizing the experience. So he's an esteemed youth, one of those guys who's on the news. I always talking about Iran and so on. He's, is Dean Op-Ed columns of the New York Times, but in this case, he's the editor and publisher for his readers. He's getting them heard. And I thought that was a wonderful use of, of his uh, position. Nick Kristoff, um, this is uh, off of his Facebook page. He's having a conversation about the future of journalism <coughs> with his readers. So rather than journalists sitting around the room, he's got a very lively uh, dozens and dozens of comments uh, posted on his Facebook page about um, the direction journalism should take. This is California Watch, uh, investigative uh, nonprofit in the Bay Area, public engagement manager, very active. Um, and uh, this is their React and Action page. So again, it was investigative reporting. Used to be, you know, they like pulled up in an office, you never knew. Even people in the newsroom didn't know what they did. And they came, uh, and once in a while, about once a year, something would arrive in the newspaper, you know. Uh, but, uh, but this is a, uh, investigative shops, many of them are very actively uh, trying to uh, build public understanding and support for what they do. Public Insight Network, uh, in a nutshell, this is a, a structured uh, system. It's a system 
or tapping the experience and expertise of people who listen to or read you. It started at Minnesota Public Radio in 2003, mm -hmm. now it has about 40 news organizations using public insight and about 140,000 people who've signed up to be served. <coughs> this is a, an example of, you know, it's easy to say, well, we want to get beyond <coughs> usual suspects and we want to find more ordinary people for our stories. This is a system that's in, in place and is uh, rapidly expanding. To, to for these organizations to build databases so if they want to find people they want to find people who um, have expertise or knowledge or experience with certain things they have a way to reach them on that level. Um, this is a the Columbia Missourian um, honestly Dean I didn't do this <laughs> there, there is a lot happening around this it's fine I love pandering it's yeah, great. Great. <laughs> Well, if you hadn't put Neo and Tommy in there, it would have been really good. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a smart man. Well, it's it, actually worse than that. You had the Daily Iowa in the center of your yeah, first yeah. screen. That was uh -huh. the editor of the Daily Iowa. Yeah, well, that's right. Karma. Exactly. Spot about us. How many people know Spot about us? It's, um, so, you know, it started out as a way to help freelancers raise money to support their stories, to match money being put up by news organizations to buy stories. And now it's being used in different ways. The Missourian used by us to fund a public records request. They got their money. And we're starting to see more public media um, use by us to raise money. You know, I think this is in the bounds. This works. Uh, you know, it needs to be matched, but it's a way of, again, being open about what you're trying to do and, and recognize that the public is stakeholders in these issues. These aren't issues for journalism, whether we know how the parking tickets uh, are used. It, it's issues for citizens. This is in collaboration. The INN, the Investigative News Network based here in LA, is um, now about 50 members, and they're doing more and more to kind of come together to pool their resources on key things <coughs> to support and expand watchdog journalism. A lot of collaboration is happening around data journalism, and um, it's almost a whole other talk, but uh, data journalism, data analysis is becoming more and more important in journalism, it, along with web applications for news. And so uh, the open source software mentality is being picked up and brought into newsrooms through this new kind of journalist specialist, journalism specialist called the data journalist. Um, and also uh, programmers, you know, journal hackers, and so on. So this is the Chicago Tribune. Steal this code. Um, all of the code they write for applications that they use at the Tribune, they write as open source code so that it can be used by anyone. They post it on a software site called GitHub. And um, this is not something that uh, matches the old proprietary mindset of news organizations. But the Tribune has increased it. The Data Journalism Handbook um, is a great resource. Uh, it's uh, online free, and it was basically drafted during a two or three day period in London at the Mozilla Festival this year as a volunteer effort by a bunch of data journalists. So you see this kind of recognition that there are hard things to do that can make the whole uh, profession. Let's, let's work on them together and not have uh, the approach that used to prevail. So my quick story on that is I was an investigative editor and I went to an IRE conference and there was a book. It was this thick. It was campaign finance that the LA Times generated and produced. It was a book, a hardbound book. And nobody could use it but the Los Angeles Times. It, you know, made perfect sense to us. He's like, wow, I wish I had that book. <laughs> Thank God we're past that. But, uh, but it just shows how much the thinking has changed. Collaboration, uh, Robert Hernandez is WJ Chat. This is a weekly chat on Twitter where web journalists just come and share knowledge. It's, it's uh, just one of many ways that uh, web journalists, people online, are, are share, actively, constantly sharing knowledge and um, helping each other. So uh, in terms of collaboration, I think there's more opportunity outside journalism because there are uh, more and more um, entities that are either grant-funded, mostly grant-funded, um, nonprofit 
that are springing up to provide information that citizens need or want. Now, this one is not grant funded. This is a group called California Common Sense, started by a, a bunch of Stanford students who decided that California is broken. Hard to argue with that. Um, and they needed fixing, and that the way to fix it was greater transparency about government spending. So they created what they call a transparency portal, started getting a lot of data and creating graphics and visualizations about this. And they caught my eye and I've talked with them a bit. This is a new, but they want to go the next step and say it's not enough to just have data and post data. We want to get citizens engaged with this, especially young people, especially people their age in college or just out of college. And so they, uh, this is a Facebook application that they ask people to look at the data, uh, look at the visualizations, look at the stories, decide what's important, vote on it. And then uh, California Common Sense is working to get elected officials to agree to respond to these concerns. There's not one journalist working in this operation, but I think the impulse that they have is closely aligned with journalism. This is another kind of uh, uh, information uh, resource for a community that's not journalism. It's based in Burlington, Vermont, Front Porch Forum. And so this is a network of neighborhood forums. There are about 200 or 300 households in each. And it says it's only open to the people in the neighborhood. It's closed. So I can't go in there and just prowl around somebody's neighborhood forum. People put their real names in. They put what streets they live on. And it's really a lot of it's like I need to I need to borrow a snowblower, you know, or anybody know the babysitter. A lot of it is, uh, is that kind of thing. But they do talk about local issues some, and all the local elected officials belong to their neighborhood forum and interact with their constituents on the forum around their concerns. And so the founders of Front Porch Forum, which is a, a commercial, they, they sell advertising uh, sponsorships. Uh, they say what we're doing is building building citizenship, and, and they think they also are providing an audience for local journalism. Um, because as people start knowing the, their neighbors' names, and not just what kind of cars they drive, uh, as they get invest more invested in the community, they see that they then become more interested in local issues. And, and um, so it's sort of the Robert Putnam, the social capital, the, the bonding capital. Um, now, what would you do if this was operating in your town and you were the editor of the paper? I called the editor of the Burlington paper and he said, I have nothing to say about Front Porch Forum. So, <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that was? I don't it's know. That was. I don't know. I mean, in these times, I cut editors a lot of slack. Um, but, uh, but they do sell advertising. It's uh, fairly micro. Um, and it could be just that it's a competitor and they're worried about it. But they, uh, but they all, sometimes in the free press will quote things that are happening on front of which forum. So, and I, and I don't believe that the, uh, man, the editor of the site believes that there's any kind of bad relationship. Mm -hmm. I might just hit him on a bad day. <laughs> I, Is it a specific to a certain neighborhood in Burlington or any part of the city? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a network of, so there's a three sisters and there's, there's a bunch of different neighborhood forums and they have, I think 50% of the households in Burlington belong to the front porch. So, you know, it's a wonderful thing. We, I asked him, could it only work in Vermont? I mean, Vermont's a, you know, a different kind of place. It has, it has you know, would it work in LA? It could work in LA. He thinks it could work anywhere. So, um, this is another kind of network. The Guardian uh, newspaper has a, a teacher network. Uh, teachers post lesson plans, they, uh, there are blogs, there are forums, and so on. It's not newspapers, per se. It's a different entity. But it uh, gives those teachers a connection with the Guardian. And it also provides the advertising department a, a, a database of registered users. I think 50,000 teachers in the teacher network here. So it does both things. Um, and so that's a different kind of collaboration between a news organization and teachers, not a revenue structure, but about issues important uh, to teachers. <coughs> so I raced through those um, 
Yeah, well, I'm a guardian. Is the U.S. a, a leader in this open journalism? Are we a follower? Are there other countries that are doing other kinds of things? Or different things? And where do we fit in this? I think yes. a lot of interesting things are happening in London. Because of what the Guardian's doing, the, the Telegraph, uh, also you know, they, they have social media managers, they interact pretty actively with people on comments. Yeah. Um, I think I think the English papers might be a little ahead in some ways as a group. That, you know, in, in the US, uh, the Times is doing a lot of interesting things, mostly away from the front page, mostly individually driven. Uh, and um, some of the small, the journal register, some of the journal register small papers are doing. Thank you. I think uh, we've, we've uh, in the past few years with a lot of the shifts, there's a good framework though for moving forward and carrying some of these, uh, these ideas and other ideas about doing journalism in a contemporary way. One is that there's just a lot more, uh, there are a lot more ways to tap into and find out what people are doing and how it's working. Um, some of these, uh, the, the data programmers, interestingly, at some of the papers have blogs where they, they write about what they're doing. Uh, but we also have um, media reports, uh, media shift, a lot of blogs that didn't exist 10 years ago that are constantly uh, sharing news about things that are being tried and experienced. There are many networks, uh, there are these conferences that become really flashpoints for, for the latest changes, South by Southwest and all of, <coughs> all of these different ways uh, that the knowledge sharing is a lot uh, easier to come by than it was in those days when you had to sign up and pay money to go to the conference if you didn't know learn how to do anything. There's a lot of free learning available. Yeah, I'll going back to the KPCC putting out we're working on the sure, about women giving birth at home. Do you know anybody in the Anderson? Contact us on the part of the story. I'm wondering how, first of all, if you know how successful that's been. And secondly, if the responses can be kept private so that other people who might be working on a similar story. No, but yeah, it's all private. I'm sorry. Public insight is private, you know. That's one of the dilemmas about it, that, yeah. that the sources are communicating <laughs> with the station, but it's not on a public forum. Okay, that's it's not, right. on it's a not like a comment board. Board. Okay. No, no. And it, they've had a good bit of success with it. They want to do more. I mean, that there's a woman named Sharon McNary who works closely with it. They got uh, one really big story through Public Insight about uh, the, uh, Ch uh, Chino uh, prison abuse. Right. Um, and that's how they... And they got it through right. Public Insight via, which took them to another place, which took them to right. another place. So, right. um, so yes, I think that, that uh, it, again, it takes work and it takes a different way of thinking. Um, <coughs> foundations, many foundations are supporting innovation and excellence and have been catalysts for moving ideas forward that weren't instantaneously commercially successful. So mm -hmm. <coughs> us is one of those ideas. But um, not, they're also working more with community foundations to, to support information in communities coming from non-journalist organizations. There's just this culture shift. We live in a time when people are, are sharing information constantly. And, and I think that um, the, the people in newsrooms are part of this. So many of them are just using this technology in their own lives. And it's not a matter of having to go take training to know how to do it. And uh, university programs are having impact in the idea of kind of teaching and learning journalism and doing journalism. Uh, is, is all those things are coming together uh, much more broadly. There have always been some institutions that did this well, but it's becoming really a, a part of the mission for university journalism programs, and I think that helps. <laughs> So I just want to come back to Nick Christoph because I, I think this uh, last thing he says is true. Mm -hmm. It is not just the same thing using different platforms and different tools. It's really a, a different way, maybe not a different way from forever, but a different way that I, than I grew up with when I went into journalism starting in 19, 
81 coming, coming out of college, I was thinking, getting back to the core of what are we trying to do? What is our mission? What are we trying to do for people? How do we have value? That value of telling people what's really happening is something that citizens appreciate, journalists appreciate. That value of serving or providing service. I think that in many ways, if you, if, when you look at polls of what citizens want from journalism and what journalists want, we line up. But now, when you ask, are we really doing that for people, that's where we don't line up. So I think the ideas in open journalism are part of uh, helping change the frame of turning journalism. Yes. <coughs> Stopping thinking about it as a product that we put out every day and thinking of, about journalism as a service that we do for people. And, and if that's your starting point, then all the methods, it's just, it's just a matter of creativity to figure out which of these tools and how to do journalism in ways that really connect with people. And that's uh, the URL for the paper, but... Um, yep. That's Thank you very much. Thank you. We'd be happy to entertain questions. Well, I'd love to hear comments. comments. Yes. Do you have the examples of where the local newspaper has joined forces with with a community-based conversation like uh, the Front Porch Forum? I mean, you talked about the Vermont newspaper editor not wanting to, to know about it. Do you have examples where there's basically been a good interaction? Um. I don't um, specifically, but I'm I'm interested to know if anybody else does it. This is this is new territory. I mean, we saw it during Hurricane Irene. I was watching that coverage very closely because I spent so long in North Carolina that you know that's kind of reflexive response to a hurricane. I've got you know I've got to do something. <laughs> so I was watching the coverage and um, and some of the coverage. Um, so the coverage of each news organization, first it was if, as if the, the hurricane was only going to hit their city or state. There, there was not a sense that this is a kind of East Coast uh, phenomenon. And so New York Times coverage was completely about the city. I mean, it was really focused on, right. you know, there was one headline at certain points, a wall of water to hit New York. <laughs> But the second thing is there were uh, organizations, and one is called uh, Crisis Commons, that were uh, online volunteer organizations doing things to kind of gather information and put out information and transmit information. And, and none of these sites were really even linking to them or aware of them. So I think that in the case of the hurricane coverage, there was almost a, a glaring omission of that recognition that news organizations weren't the only ones. Now it got better as the, as the hours wore on. The Times did a really good social media guide at a certain point. So I think that the awareness was there. But I think there's huge opportunity in doing that. Melanie, well, I was just on a, a live chat thing with Ombudsman. The Ombudsman of the Washington Post now. Reader, editor, public editor of the New York Times. And you know, I know, that the Washington Post uh, ombudsman at one point had said something about the innovation is just coming too quickly. And then Jay Rosen, you know, came and interviewed him. And of course, the notion that any newspaper is moving too quickly certainly feels familiar <coughs> for the reader of that newspaper, but feels it's an easy target of uh, criticism from somebody thinking newsrooms aren't going to move quickly enough to survive. So we're, you know, it, you, men you mentioned at one point that each former newspaper editor you've spoken with has some sense of, I wish I had pushed back, I wish I had pushed even harder. But you, you pushed hard. I mean, it's hard to push in these situations. What do you think? Will we see newspapers changing more quickly, finally? Or will we see digital first, you know, coming up rather than a kind of a calculation of every time, every piece of dollars or time we spend on the digital means we're going to lose a reporter. You know, I mean, the, all the fighting back against change. Now, I, I wrote a, a post in my WordPress blog uh, that was inspired partly by that ombudsman piece. Um, you know, I, I don't think that you can say the problem with the Washington Post is it's innovating too quickly. Um, you know, I, I think that the uh, the 
the, challenge, the challenges of innovation, everybody puts their bullseye on newsrooms, and there's a lot of ways that newsrooms need to do some of the things I'm talking about and more. You know, there, there's a, uh, but the problems that the news industry is having now come from the loss of advertising, not the loss of audience as much. Maybe. With the, with the gains in online readership, many newsrooms have more audience now than they had 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that the conversation keeps coming back to um, what could newsrooms do to fix the problem. And, um, and I don't think newsrooms can do anything to fix that problem of the, of, of the, the advertising collapse. But newsrooms, in terms of innovating around how journalism connects with people can do a lot more and that's that's where I wish um, it's you know it's not so much of because I did do everything I could think of I think that there's tremendous uh, cultural um, resistance in newsrooms to uh, change uh, well there's always resistance to change that you don't try to and, and that's, you can't fall, I mean, it's hard. I, mean, I don't think that you're in Edinburgh, you all are immune, right? Uh, and, and so the question is, how do we improve? And that's the question I tried to raise at the B as I was doing that, was not how do we change, but how do we improve? Because that's what you're really after, so how do we? And so um, at the Post, there's been a big emphasis on measurement. Because with, with online, you can measure. You can know if things get read. You can know if people spend time on the site. And I think from knowing some people inside that newsroom, that's where there's a has been a feeling there's too much emphasis on that and not on some other thing. But also, you know, um, is there ever a newsroom where you, you don't have some of that? Is there ever a, a change you can make in the newspaper that you don't have people that can call you? So when we changed anything in the print paper, we would always tell people, we're not really changing it, you know. The, the page is getting smaller, but the newspaper is still the same. We're, we're taking away these sections and we're combining these sections, but it, it's still the same. And, and I think that's a really strange message, you should imagine. Ford designed a new car and we cannot send. It's the new Ford, but it's still the same, you know. It's completely confusing. So I, I wish I'd been, uh, had different conversations with readers around the change. Engage them more as advisors and consultants on the change. <coughs> yeah. Yes. To what extent did you use, or could you use, open journalism in the process you went through here of assembling a report, which is in the next print form? I picked it off a pointer, or so you're doing kind of traditional things now. Did you have any sites like this where people could send in comments? And Oh yeah, this but was the afterthought. Tell us, yeah, tell us how you did that. Uh, well, it's actually published online. Um, yeah. It was uh, the Annenberg Innovation Lab uh, helped me build a website for a simple website, mm -hmm. and you can uh, respond and post comments on it. And it hasn't had as so many comments as you'd hope. And so one of the, one of the challenges for us is that there's so much flying around. It's hard mm -hmm. to get people's attention. And hard to get people's attention to read a, a 15,000 word. Paper. Um, so, yes, it's the you know the, the old adage. If I'd had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. If I'd had more time, I might have written a shorter report with many more visuals, uh, and, and more um, examples. But I did include a hundred links that show not these same, um, some of the same, but many other different uh, examples of ways that people are, are taking these ideas and writing them. So if you were here and you were teaching in the course, what would you emphasize and how would you incorporate this into the curriculum? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that in some ways this gets back to reporting, source building, understanding uh, how people, uh, what people are doing, where their interests and passions are, how they're connecting with one another, where conversations are happening in the community, and how to get yourself as a reporter into the right places to learn things. And so it's source source building um, and reporting, and, um, and then 
on the on writing the presentation side, I think it, uh, it comes into thinking about doing interactive journalism. Um, Joy Mayer, um, who was a, a Reynolds Fellow, uh, wrote a, a guide on engagement on, uh, and, and how to, how to measure it. Um, there, there are two different uh, sort of resource guides that came out of her work um, that, are, that are both useful, including uh, there was a result of a brainstorming uh, session where they had a lot of people gathered to talk about this very thing. How do, you, how do you do engagement and how do you know if it works and how do you measure it? And so there, um, there's information in there. So there are things that can be taught and learned. I think the hardest thing um, in newsrooms is always to avoid being insular. And computer technology actually made that worse because it's easy for people to really sit at their desk all day, talk to people on the phone, email, and do research on the web and so on, and um, uh, that whole idea of getting out of the community. So many of these tactics are really new ways of getting out of the community, finding the community, finding the use. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, Hi, Castle. Uh, to go back to a point you made a few minutes ago, you were talking about um, sort of combining sections in some cases, but still, you know, assuring your audience that the amount of content you were producing, you know, was staying the same or even expanding. In what situations do you think it's appropriate to maybe even downsize the print edition of the paper to focus on online or local distribution? That's a that's a very interesting question. So there are two answers. One answer is what serves the readership. Um, and uh, so print readers generally aren't looking for less, I can tell you. When we talk to print readers, generally what they say is, I want more of this. Um, so from the audience standpoint, what's surprising isn't that print readership has dropped. It's surprising how strong print readership is given the reality that there's no reason in the world that you need to write a print newspaper. There's nothing that you have that you can't get elsewhere that's not in a print newspaper. But it's a form that people will like. So my guess is that the audience appetite for print will, if things keep going as they've been going, will outlast the economic viability of delivering print every day. So it, so that's, that's a real quandary because most of the reductions in the print edition have not been in service to the readers, been in service to the economic realities. Now, that, that said, uh, there is a shift going on to electronic forms. And you know, I know many of the faculty around here have told me that they don't use print much anymore and uh, use clipboard or use various ways uh, to so there is a shift going on, and so I think that the uh, question is how to serve what people like and value in the print edition and can carry out this transition. So it's not an easy question to answer. Most people, I think, would really appreci appreciate um, the size of paper that the Guardian prints. It's called the Berliner size. And it's a very uh, handy and appealing and attractive size of paper. And many papers would love to print that size. And the problem is that we have these old, uh, these presses that, that you cannot easily adapt to print that size of newspaper. So it's again, you know, uh, the, the challenges of the, of, the, of the newspaper industry, there are so many of them that even the, the most innovative um, newsroom can't get around the fact that you have these content <coughs> management systems that aren't built to do the things that we want to do today. And so these are, these are I think, um, some of the industrial issues. Can I ask you what you think about that question? What your answer to that question is? Uh, it's something I'm kind of looking into right now. I think, I don't know, I mean, I guess it depends on, you know, who the paper is serving, if it's local or national and I guess, you know, what kind of readership you have, what, you know, what the readers are attached to. So, I don't know, I'm looking into it in regards to you know, like student papers um, with the YouTube where pretty much, you know, every student at USC has online access all the time, so it makes sense that their news is delivered 
and that form but at the same time people are still attached to the right content. So it just kind of depends on who's good your time. The University of Georgia paper stopped printing daily I that, yeah. this year, and I don't know, if I haven't heard how it went, but I actually heard it was going pretty badly for them um, in terms of just like supporting themselves through advertising. They've been having a hard time with it, but I still think it's an interesting idea. I think I don't know if they made their actual paper small, but I think they went to once a week. Once a week, but, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of both a follow-on to that question and maybe a different version of Geneva's question. I think I agree with you that the uh, the old advertising model has has broken down, and we're not going to put it back together again. Um, <coughs> got me thinking about the last probably really significant change in the, in the business model for the print newspapers was when the penny press came in and and replaced with uh, advertising revenue, the old model, which had been heavily dependent on what were at the time very expensive subscription mm -hmm. revenues to, to a select audience. So the, the question is, can you think of any possible models uh, that will, in the same way, take advantage of modern technologies, including participatory audiences and all those kinds of things? That will build a business model of some kind that will that will support quality journalism. That's a really hard question. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. And if we had the answer, we'd both be with. If anybody has the answer, that's please join That's right. Well, I mean, the other way, I think the other way to look at also the build advertising model breaking down is another way of putting that is the old omnibus model of advertising that was the newspaper model that was used to build newspapers and 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 newspapers of the newspaper broke down. You know, mm -hmm. people don't need a newspaper to get their crossword puzzle, get their cartoons, get their sports, and get it all. They can get it all in slivers and, and, and other ways. So, as another way to frame the question is: Is, is there a sliver strategy for yes. for good journalism? I think so, and I think that um, you know some people. So the, there's a theory that because uh, going. Reducing the frequency of the newspaper would actually save the company's money. And in many cases, newspapers make uh, lose money on certain days of the week by producing a print edition. So if you can sustain the uh, readership and keep the other days of the week, then you can reduce the cost. So I think we're probably going to see frequency change. And uh, I like think like the that Detroit experiment. I think what I'm, what I'm longing to see and what I believe is possible, and I think you're starting to see in some newspaper companies, is that idea of different, a portfolio of different kinds of ways to, to serve different audiences um, and uh, monetize that. So a bundle of slivers rather than an omnibus. Right. And so, you know, the Post had Kaplan and that worked for a long time. Uh, you know, the Guardian, um, the way they make their money, Auto Trader. They, they're all by a trust. The, the, the revenue comes from Auto Trader. Yes. You know, I'm just following on the same <coughs> theme. When you um, when you in, drew the conclusion that there's journalism is shifting from being a product to a service, one of the implications of that is that people will pay for the journalism, right. which right. has not been the case for right. a long time. Um, and as opposed to a product that is an advertising delivery vehicle. Mm -hmm. So, so where, where do you see evidence that there is a viable service industry model for inf for journalistic information, and that people will pay specifically for it as a service? Well, I think public media. People give money to, to KPCC, not because they're paying to listen to the radio, but because they believe in what the KPCC newsroom is doing. So it's a, it, they're paying for that as something they believe in. And that, to me, is a service. They believe the KPCC provides a service to the community. And so the word service has a lot of, a lot of range to it. I think people who pay the New York Times subscription model are paying for it because they believe in it as a service to them. Well, I think but there's, there's yet another model, very much for profit model, and that's iTunes, which is mm -hmm. people yes. are not really paying iTunes for it. Right. Mm -hmm. 
because of getting mail because they're paying for the convenience and for, convenience. Mm -hmm. for the service. So I keep thinking, like you, there's a, there's a model for that. For journalism. Really, printing, printing the news and bundling it and delivering it to your door is a service. But the service also, one, one no longer I mean, there's, there's yeah. a history in public broadcasting for that to, you know, you know, in order for us to exist, you have to support us. Right. Whereas, like, I'm, I, I belong to, I, I, I read the, the Milwaukee papers mostly because I'm a cheese head and I like to see how my teams are doing. And they just implemented a, uh, a pay model. Mm -hmm. And the comments, and I think this is across the board, I know for sure, it's, it's down like 80%. And there's been this really interesting discussion, well, why shouldn't you pay for it? I mean, and, but there's no culture Right. Of of actually saying, well, actually, you know, don't you think these people deserve to get paid? This, how else are newspapers going to survive? A few people are coming out and saying that, but most people are not accustomed because it isn't part of the culture. Whereas public broadcasting, it is. So, mm -hmm. it seems to be one question would be how do you how do you educate? How do you say? How do you actually create service as a value that the readers come to accept? You know what I mean? I don't know how one does that. Dan Gilmore, um, everybody knows who Dan Gilmore is. He, he said, you know, that he said, okay, I don't want to pay, you know, it doesn't have to be the pay for a newspaper subscription, but if you say, we're keeping watch on the county government in San Mateo, he said, I'll pay for that, I'll, I'll support that. And so I think it does, this is why I think it's so important that the people who do journalism make it as clear and, and transparent as possible to people about how you do it, what's involved um, in small ways, like these little um, social media interactions I'm talking about. In larger ways, um, at the beam, whenever a, we had a, a, a talk with a photographer, a news photographer talking about how they did their craft, people flock to it. I think that, um, that I think that the more people understand about what it takes to produce journalism, this is what public radio does. It's like, you know, um, they don't produce anywhere near the volume of, of coverage that, um, that a newspaper produces. But news, newspapers, we never, you know, the New York Times spends how much to keep people in Iraq, and when do you ever know about that? Except, I think, maybe for a court or the column. Or but, um, so, you know, there, I think that this, again, is part of the we need a culture shift where you say people in the community are stakeholders in right. having Absolutely. quality journalists. One small sign in that regard, if I could just jump in a minute, is what you mentioned in terms of community foundations are becoming interested in journalism yes. as a yes. social good. Right. Right. And starting to fund it and starting to, I mean, we're getting foundations who are encouraging community groups to view it that way. So that that's one helpful shift in that regard. If I just offer sort of a a different opinion on this. I think it's a basic demand and supply problem. I think there's an oversupply of conventional media, as in daily newspapers, online services, whatnot. And uh, there's still a great market for niche publications, yes. publications that go to very specific topics where they can generate very high advertising revenues. And I think what really needs to happen, and this is not a popular thing to say, but I think the overall news industry as we know it in this country now needs to shrink more to get demand or to get supply back in alignment with demand. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally think um, in this society, news is has had a financial value. It always has had a financial value. And I think that will probably be the prevailing model in the future as well rather than a cultural shift or um, a finance model that pr primarily relies on the foundations. I, I really think it goes back to demand and supply and then to the market. Yeah, and where, where I wouldn't agree with you is in many local communities and uh, in terms of covering uh, statewide issues in many states. I don't think there is an oversupply <laughs> of journalism. Yeah. So One last part question. of it is oh, we're moving mass to class D. Now our audience, but I wonder if you talk about the shifts. Do you see any analogies or comparisons with the shift that took place with television, which before was totally free over the air, mm -hmm. and when cable TV came in, mm -hmm. why would people pay for something that they can get for free? Right. Initially, cable when it went urban in the late uh, 70s, there was no HBOs and CNNs and all that stuff, but yet people did. Paid basically 
channels they could get for nothing. Do you see any comparison? I mean, we're look, looking off the print model here. I don't wonder if there's other media models you could be looking at. I think, you know, television uh, is facing its own its own existential crisis, too, about uh, ownership and control and monetization. But, um, well, I meant what I happened then as to what's happening now with print. So I think what, what you're observing, uh, I'm not as familiar with you know what happened, what actually happened with that shift. But I think, again, that question of um, what is it that people are, are paying for? Uh, is it the news stories themselves, or are, or are they stakeholders in certain kinds of coverage? Or is it a kind of coverage that they can't truly can't get elsewhere? Or is it a service like newsletters and the whole uh, newsletter service that goes to niche audiences around certain things? And so I think we're just going to see more hybrids. The interesting ideas out there about co-ops, use co-ops in communities. I think the need is acute in many communities, and there's not there's not you know uh, it, an obvious solution on the horizon that's going to fix things. So paywalls is what people are working on now, and, and that you know at least for now seems to be providing some help. So. Melanie, you've given us so much in this report and in these remarks, and you are going to find, I can assure you, that you're going to find new ways of sharing this, and it's going to keep on getting the kind of attention you deserve. So thank you so much. Okay.